So I think his name, I don't know, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Semmel Weiss. He was the gentleman who arguably has saved more people than anybody else in medicine. Do you have any idea who it is? No. Is he the penicillin guy? Not the penicillin. That's, uh, what's his name? Sir Fleming. I think oh, that's okay. Fleming. He's a, I think he was a Scottish uh, uh, physician, if I'm not mistaken. No, this guy is the gentleman who uh, told other physicians that they should oh, wash their hands. Wash their hands. Yes. So do you remember? He was a, I think he was a Hungarian uh, physician who was noticing that a lot of, there was this huge mortality rate of women as they were giving birth. And so he started running these naturally occurring experiments where you either, so the, the physician has just worked on a cadaver and then goes and does the obstetrics. Okay. So when he said, wash your hands, he, he, he died, I think, penniless, destitute, in a mental asylum or something, right? And then later, people said, oops, he was right, right? Because they didn't understand bacteria back they then. They didn't understand bacteria. What, what? Yeah, that guy. That right? That's it. Samuel Weiss, exactly. Cadervic particles? Does that mean? Cadavers. Cadavers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So every case of childhood fever was caused by res resorption of cadaveric particles. Oh, my God. But the blowback against this guy from oh the senior God. physicians, I mean, this guy was destitute. He died completely uh, unvalidated. I mean, it was only post hoc that he, there you go, nervous breakdown. So allegedly suffered a nervous breakdown, was committed to an asylum by his colleagues. In the asylum, he was beaten by the guards. Oh, God. It's incredible story. Here, here's another one. I don't remember his name. The, the truth tester, Jamie, will get it out for us. There's a gentleman who won the Nobel Prize, I, I'd say in the last 20 or 30 years, for arguing that ulcers are caused by a particular virus, or I don't know if it's a virus or a bacterium, and everybody laughed him out of town. Mm. He ended up winning the Nobel Prize. And so I often joke with my students, I say, if people laugh at your ideas and fight them, it's either for one of two reasons. It's a really shitty idea, and it's it's worthy of that derision, right. or prepare to go to Stockholm to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, literally- Right, it's the, one or the other. It's one or the other, because yeah. the Nobel Prize is nothing but a history of people saying, what a quack this moron is. Mm -hmm. No way, oops, here's your Nobel Prize, doctor. And isn't that because of what we talk about, because of ego, and that ego exactly. being connected to your ideas, if someone comes along with a revolutionary idea that's contrary to what you currently believe, you take it as an affront to yourself. Exactly. It's horrible. So I so I gave a talk, this is going back to some of my early appearances here where we would talk a lot more evolutionary psychology. I gave a talk, at, uh, two talks at University of Michigan when my first book came out. It was an academic book, Evolutionary Basis of Consumption. How do you apply evolutionary psychology and human behavior in general, consumer behavior in particular? I give the talk in the psychology department on a Thursday and everybody's like, oh yeah, this is gorgeous. Because a lot of the psychologists were trained in physiological psychology, biological psychology, and so on. So they they were totally appreciative of the fact that you can't really study human behavior without understanding the biological signatures of human behavior. Okay, then I go to the business school the next day, Ross School of Business. I give the exact same talk, okay? I couldn't finish a single sentence because all of the professors, and it was usually the professor, it wasn't the doctoral students who were, because the doctoral students are still malleable. Their brains mm. are still being formed. They're happy to listen. It's the senior professor who has spent 30 years arguing that human minds are born tabula rasa, empty slated, and it's only socialization that teaches the consumer to be how he or she is, that mm. they were really offended by my stuff. So they would constantly interrupt me and berate me. And I remember as a, as a side personal note, my wife was in the audience that day. She had come with me. And prior to that talk, she had said, oh, I, I feel really sick. I probably have food poisoning. We later find out, found out that she was pregnant with our first daughter. So there's both a really bad memory and a really uh, good memory associated with the University of Michigan. So what was their position when you were saying this? Uh, biology does not... Ex we so they were interrupting you? Nonstop. I, I probably got through, so let's say, I don't remember the, the number of slides. Let's say I had 30 slides. I maybe got to slide 10. Because, so mm. here's first question. Oh, if, if everything is due to evolutionary pressures, how do you explain homosexuality then? If everything is due to survival instinct, how do you explain uh, suicide then? By, by the way, there are evolutionary explanations for suicide and homosexuality, right? Uh, humans are a sexually reproducing species even though chaste monks exist, right? Uh, 
people do have a survival instinct, even though some people commit suicide. Uh, men are taller than women, even though your Aunt Julie is taller than your Uncle Bob. So what happens with, with people in terms of a cognitive obstacle, they take a singular datum as mm. proof that a statement that is true at the population level has been violated. It, has, it hasn't, right? Mm. Every single WNBA player is taller than most men. That does not invalidate the fact that men are taller than women. Right. So all of the morons in the, in the, at the University of Michigan were also coming to that kind of stuff, right? Uh, because they didn't like the idea, to, to our earlier discussion that we've had on the show, a lot of people don't like the idea that we are biologically determined. They think that that's a form of, you're just an executor of your genes. But that's a wrong view, by the way, because everything is an interaction between your genes and the environment, right? Mm. Even specific genes get turned on as a function of the environment. So. The fact that you believe that we have biological imperatives that guide our behavior doesn't make us blind executors of our genes. Right. Look at this. Whoa. Boom. Look how they're sliding all over the place. I mean, that is fucking ice. Yeah. That guy can't stop his car. Look. Look, he's just going to slide in that car behind him. This is oh ridiculous. Is that he can't stop it. Oh, shit. Boom. And, and that car's going. sliding. They're all sliding. The whole thing is ice.